that's not the voice, is it? All right. Just waiting for a few more people to join. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to start? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a bookseller at Belmont Books. For those of you unfamiliar with us, we are um, an independent locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts in the Boston area. I just wanna thank you all for, for coming and joining us tonight. Um, we actually have a lot of events like this in addition to book launches and author conversations. We have, um, you know, we have a couple of book clubs. We have story times. I believe on the 14th, we have a book club, uh, a virtual book club meeting for the Overstory by Richard Powers, which I wanna say won a Pulitzer. Uh, later in the month, we have a story time for Women's History Month. If either of those events interest you or you're curious what other events we might have, uh, you can register online on our website for those. I will provide a link in the chat uh, in a bit. On our website, you can also purchase tonight's book, uh, I Am My Beloved, and I highly recommend that you do. It is fantastic. Um, before we begin, I'd like to mention, uh, as far as questions go, please type them in the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, we will try to answer as many as we can, but we will answer them towards the end of the event, uh, starting around 7.45, going until about eight o'clock or so. Um, if you happen to put your question in the chat box instead of the Q&A, no big deal, we'll try to get to you as well. Um, before I turn this over to, uh, to Jonathan and Steve, I would just like to, you know, give a little background information on them. Uh, so Jonathan Papernick was born and raised in Toronto. He is the author of two short story collections and three novels, the most recent being I Am My Beloveds. He serves as senior writer in residence in the writing literature and publishing department at Emerson College in Boston, where he has taught since 2007. He lives on Boston's South Shore with his wife, stepdaughters, and sons. Steve Yarbrough is the author of 12 books, most recently the novel Stay Gone Days, due out in April 2022, and you can actually buy that through our website as well. Steve is currently a professor in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing at Emerson College. Uh, now, I will put the links for buying the book and signing up for events in the chat in just a sec. But without further ado, I would like to turn this conversation over to Jonathan and Steve. I guess I'll, uh, I'll start and say what a pleasure it is to be here with you, uh, John. And I was lucky to get an early look at this book and uh, was enormously taken with it. So um, I wonder if we could start by getting you to, to read a little bit from it. Absolutely, uh, and thank you so much, Steve. I'm really honored that you uh, took the time and that you, you read my book and, and that you liked it. It means a lot to me from such a uh, um, successful writer with such a amazing kind of uh, pile of books. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna um, read um, about three pages from the opening of chapter two of I Am My Beloveds. Um, it'll be take about five minutes, and then I believe um, uh, Steve and I are going to speak for maybe you know thirty five minutes or so, and then go to the Q and A. So I'll just start in chapter two. Ben sat alone on his and Shira's sensible microfiber couch, laptop propped on his knees, entirely miserable. Shira was out canoodling with her girlfriend again, while Ben scrolled through a dizzying carousel of profile pics on Tinder, leaden heart thudding in his chest. 
It was Shira's night with Liz, and the two of them were at a pie day party at some down market rental in Jamaica Plain. Shira had baked a blueberry pie and dressed for the occasion with a handmade symbol stitched to her sweater. No matter how innocently it began, the night would end with Shira in Liz's bed. Ben thought he had put that nightmare of doubt and longing behind him when he had married Shira and they had started in earnest to build a life together. Shira had always been there for Ben when it counted most, offering warmth and comfort and love. He had done the same for Shira and that finely calibrated construct of falling and catching, falling and catching, felt as if it would carry them through to forever. But this past year had been the hardest of Ben's life since the year his parents had died. During those endless nights, when Shira was out doing things with Liz Bird he wished not to imagine, it felt as if Shira had spirited away some essential element of himself and that he was disappoint disappearing amid the middle-class trappings of their well-appointed suburban condo. Ethical non-monogamy was supposed to be a good thing for them, but Ben felt as if he had drawn the short blade that cut deeper with every passing day. Aside from going for another run, the only way Ben knew how to fill the emptiness he carried in his chest was to drag himself back to the apps and the confounding wilderness of online dating. He could never quite understand what cis and gender fluid and sapiosexual were supposed to mean, or whether he was ISO, a GF, or FWB, ALTR, or just some basic TLC, as he stumbled his way into a world in which size queens took sole measure of worth in inches and girth, in which bondage and domination was considered an asset, even a kindness, and every new human connection was a disposable thing with more, always more and greater possibilities, strutting their stuff just over the digital horizon. The apps were never the magic sorting hat Ben wished them to be, but that didn't stop him from returning again and again to the illuminated screen of his phone in search of someone, anyone, who would make him feel less alone. Maybe finding a girlfriend of his own would make Shira realize that he was still a man in full, not a roommate, but a husband worthy of her attentions in bed and out. Over the past month, Ben had sent out no fewer than 27 personalized, grammatically correct messages to various women on Tinder, OkCupid, JDate, and even Ashley Madison. His screen name was simply Ben Architect, not Pat's Fan 69, 420 Guy, or Who's Your Daddy. So he already had a leg up on some of his competition. That and the fact that he never began a conversation with a gross come on line about the awesome ramming power of his monster cock or his desire to go down on her like the, like the Titanic, but rather with a thoughtful callback to something meaningful from each of their bios. Because he looked non-threatening in his brand new cobalt blue polo shirt, fixed smile plastered to his face, he soon found himself juggling several hopeful conversations with Kristen OKC, Kristen Tinder, and Jen number four. But these conversations often went nowhere as Ben's charm abandoned him, or the women read deep enough into his profile to figure out he was married and they disappeared. Ben's smartphone address book was a graveyard of lost hopes. Two Abigails, two Kellys, three Megans, one of whom Ben kissed as a red line train roared into Park Street Station, and four Jens, punctuated by a solitary Chelsea, Heidi, Kat, Lisa, Millie, Sam, Susie, Teresa, Violet, Zoe, and a woman who insisted Ben call her Khaleesi, mother of dragons. Most depressingly, Shira, um, most depressingly, Jane had blocked Ben months earlier when he had told her he and Shira had opened up their marriage and he was looking for someone special, wink, wink, telling Ben she was uncomfortable hanging out with him and that flirting had been fun when it felt safe and that she cared about him, but she needed to step back for both herself and her husband who would be freaked out if he knew Ben was willing to cross that line from friendship to sex. That was why when Ben's phone lit up with a simple unexpected text from Kristen OKC saying, Kay, meet you there at nine. Ben's heart, his tiny battered heart, filled his chest with relief. Ben stood a fit six foot one with a straightish white smile, solid shoulders and a flat stomach. His eyes were a neutral brown, his aquiline nose well proportioned. There was nothing particularly distinguishing about the way he looked. He'd been mistaken more than a few times for that guy from that place. But sometimes from the right angle with just the right lighting, he believed he looked downright dashing. But he was losing his hair, mousy brown and prone to curling, not by the handful, but enough he could see his hairline creep back a few millimeters every couple of months. Ben still had most of his hair, but he was sure he'd be bald by 40. In his profile pictures, he managed to artfully crop himself mid-forehead rather than relying on the obvious baseball cap to hide his most glaring flaw. 
So he hoped his receding hairline wasn't a deal breaker with Kristen OKC, as he suspected it had been with some of the others. Kristen OKC sporting a sleeveless sequin mini dress, an auburn side braid tied at the tip with a purple ribbon and thick framed librarian glasses, sitting at the crowded mahogany bar of a hip Davis Square night spot looked exactly as advertised. Hey, Kristen OKC said, uh, spotting Ben approach. She greeted him with a friendly hug and an air kiss, which Ben took to be a good sign as he slid into the chair next to her. Ben's lungs ached as if they were filled with wet sand. As good as Kristen OKC looked, she wasn't Shira. He only wanted to be with Shira. Every date with a new woman followed a familiar pattern, hope, then longing, then sadness. But Ben was determined to do his best to show Kristen OKC he was the fun, kind, chill dude he promised in his profile. So that's it for now. I'm, I'm really glad that you chose that particular passage to read because I'm gonna have a question. Um, for you about it later. Could I ask you to just do me one favor? Um, could you read the first paragraph of the novel for everybody? Sure, I can do that. All right, first paragraph. Ben Seidel's heart was still pounding from his run around frigid spy pond when his wife Shira swept into their living room wearing a little black dress, flared jauntily at the hem and a pair of glossy black pumps Ben had never seen her wear before. Ben in his orange compression tights and sweat wicking pullover could not have looked more at odds with his wife of eight years. There you go. Okay, thank you. So um, the reason I ask you to read that paragraph is that, you know, it, you and I both teach creative writing students, fiction writing students specifically. And one of the things that um, I always tell them, probably to the point that they think I'm just a broken record, is that in every novel, or for that matter, every story, one of the things that you're signaling to the reader early on in the book, in this case, is how to read it, how it's going to work. And what interests me specifically about that paragraph is how we move from um, Ben's own mind, what he's seeing, just pulling back a little bit and looking at Ben and having the, the narrator make a judgment about it. And this is, this is a technique that pretty much gets used up all the way through the novel to one degree or another. We never lose sight of him. We're allowed to look at him, for instance, a lot more than I probably would be able to get a reader to do in one of my books. So, um, I'm sure that you must have been aware of that. And I'm curious why you wanted us to, to maintain at various times enough distance to look at him from the outside. Well, I, I do generally prefer to write in a close third person, first of all, just to kind of give that, that experience of being in the head, to have the experiences um, you know, so we can have his thoughts and have his feelings. And I thought for something like this, it was important. But I also felt to have a little bit of a uh, slight outside perspective on this because uh, I don't think he would be able to have the necessary perspective on it. And, you know, there was, I guess, a subtle framing uh, or editorial commentary in that kind of outside kind of perspective there um, because Ben is not me, um, but I wanted to kind of uh, present this character where we have all of his experiences, but also kind of frame it a little bit with my, my own authorial framing to kind of say, you know, here's a little bit about what I think of him. And so what I'm, what I'm also curious about is when you wrote the opening paragraph, were you aware that you were doing it for that particular reason or did it just go that way and did you just decide to run with it then? Well, I'll let you in on a little secret, but just you. Um, the first chapter was the second last chapter I wrote or perhaps the last chapter. Um, I wrote the whole book and then I got to the end and uh, didn't write the last chapter. And uh, then I was like, I don't know uh, what I'm going to do here. And then I, I had a few people read it. And, and one of them is, is the great writer, Caroline Levitt, who I believe is watching. And, uh, you know, after, after talking to her, um, she suggested that I start a little bit earlier. And uh, so when I went back and did that, I kind of came up with that. So the character, the whole kind of perspective and point of view thing had already been established at that point. But I wrote that first chapter in about an hour. 
um, because I'd been living in this book for so long that, um, you know, I, I don't know if you feel this when you write, but it, uh, chapters go much faster when you get to the end. You know, I, I could spend months writing the first chapter, I, I sit down to write, but when you get to the end, they come out with very few changes. So I was already well established into, into this book and this voice when, when I got to that point. Yeah, yeah I, I did tend to find myself um, speeding up at the end. What I, what I do, and I'm curious if you do this at the beginning of a book, is I consciously force myself to move very slowly because I don't yet know exactly how the book is working. And it takes me a while to figure it out. And I'm reluctant to get myself into too much trouble that I, that I then have to go back and redo. Do you move slowly in the no, other? No, I, I, I actually don't. I mean, I, it takes me a long time for my books to come out because I end up taking months long breaks when I'm like either stuck on, on the plot or I've lost my confidence. Um, but no, I, I, I move pretty quickly actually. And I make mistakes and it comes out not as good. I mean, when you read the book, it feels like this is the way it, it's meant to be and the way it always was, but this went through a number of drafts. So mm -hmm. the original uh, opening line was, it was really in medias res. I mean, he was already in the relationship with his girlfriend at that time. And he, they'd already had a fight and he's showing up at her house and she's dressed in lingerie. And that was like the first page of the story, which is the wrong place to start. So um, I just kind of let my confidence and energy take me and make all those mistakes, knowing that you can revise it later. So I actually, I actually try and lay down as many pages as I can uh, as quickly as I can. So I've got a reality, um, something to work off of, I guess. The, the novelist Dick Bausch, Richard Bausch, once sent me an email. Um, I think I was writing and I just stopped for a minute to check my email. And he asked me a question that at first I thought was just bizarre. Um, and then when I posed it to myself, I was surprised at the answer. It just said, hey, Steve, um, when, you've, when you're six or eight months away from a book, do you remember any of the choices you made when, when you were writing it? And I thought for a second, and the answer was no, I don't remember. And I'm curious if you do. Uh, I do, I think. Uh, they're one of the few things I remember. Uh, I mean, I just, I just watched Squid Game last week after having watched it three months earlier and forgotten all of it. So, but I think I do remember a lot of the choices here because I kind of agonize over it. Um, I mean, if you were to ask any section of the book, I'd probably be able to kind of let you know what my thinking was. I don't know if that'll be the, the case a year from now or five years from now, but I know for years after my first book was written, I could have told you what I was thinking for every sentence. Um, Cause a lot of the, there was, I had a lot of different sources pulling together and I was able to do that for years. So yeah, it's just when you're in that project, you kind of merge with it. But generally speaking, I don't, I don't remember anything else in my life. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you mentioned Caroline Leavitt, and one of the things, um, and, and she wrote a, you know, a, an extraordinary blurb for your book, just, you know, really, really appreciative. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed was that uh, I think three of, the, three of the authors who commented uh, very favorably on the book were women writers, and you know, this is a this is a book that deals very frankly with sex, and um, our our main character is, of course, a guy. And there are times when it's easy to love him, and there are times when it's not so easy to love him. And it just felt to me like you you know you were venturing into territory that I suspect a, a lot of male writers would be scared to go into today, given how fraught the times are um, when it comes to sexual relations. Were you scared when you did it? It doesn't look like you were. No, no, I, I wasn't. Uh, I don't really get scared about those sorts of things. I'm actually writing a sequel of this and uh, most of it's in Shira's point of view. And uh, I actually feel like in, after a third of the way, after the first act, I feel like she's coming alive very well. But no, um, again, I worked very closely with um, another uh, very important woman in my life. Uh, Michelle Kaplan was the um, person who edited my previous book, the, the Book of Stone. And I always thought that, that Michelle was the, the person who helped, who made me become the writer I always thought I, I could be. Um, 
because the Book of Stone was actually a rewrite of a previous book I'd written called Who by Fire, Who by Blood, in retrospect, was an unfinished book. So, you know, I hired her uh, as a developmental editor to work with me on this. And we were in very close touch with this. And, you know, I, I, I generally think I do get along better with women and I'm able to have some kind of insight into many of the, the pitfalls that men fall into. But, you know, working closely with both Michelle and Caroline and then having those other women read it who, who I'm also quite close friends with, I, I felt that just three or four really smart women uh, have, have, have vouched for it, that it's okay. I didn't doubt it, but it was always nice to be confirmed that that's the case. Right. I sometimes tell people that I have two and a half um, close male friends. The others are the others are all women as well. Um, one of the things that caught me about your book that I admired enormously was that um, you know you you pick some books up and they stay in they stay in one tonality the whole time. It's grim or it's wildly funny um and you're you're able in the same novel to move through different registers and through various tonalities there are moments here that are deeply painful there are also moments that are wildly funny and there's everything in between and um again i just wonder um if you're aware that you're going to do that when you go into the book or is it a matter of just feeling what the moment really seems to, to call for? Yeah, I think I'm aware of it. I mean, I know that we all contain multitudes uh, and I, I am aware of my previous book and I was aware of the entire painful time I was writing the book of stone and, and, and the earlier version who by fire who by blood was that there was not a second of humor in that book. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I remember years ago speaking to the writer, Steve Almond, and he said, you know, you're a really funny guy. Why don't you, put some humor into your writing. And I was like, yeah, I should do that. Um, you know, this is the first book I've ever written in which nobody dies. I mean, all my other books literally have suicide bombings in them, every one. Um, so yeah, I, I was aware of that. Um, you know, a lot of this was filtering through my own personal kind of feelings. I mean, I I could be very up at one point in the day and, and think my life is over. And later on in the day, everything could feel great. Uh, and in that way, I think Ben was was psychologically based on me a little bit. Okay. Um, this is one of the most cinematic novels I've read in a long time. And of course, that's really after my heart. Um, and, you know, I, I found a lot of writers, you know, they're, they appear to be terrified of writing dialogue, which always puzzles me because... Um, it's the thing that I gravitate to most easily. What do you think the key is to being able to, to bring different characters on um, and keep them from sounding alike? Because you know your dialogue does everything in the world to bring the characters alive and to make them individuals. What's, what's the key to that? Well, let me just start with the caveat that I'm gonna say that I find writing to be extremely difficult. Writing is very hard, but when I get into that zone, however I get there, and it's hard to get into that zone, it just happens. You know, I believe that there's a, uh, a much, um, you know, sorry, something has popped up in front of me, um, a much smarter version of, uh, of myself, you know, within me. My screen just disappeared here. So like, you know, like your subconscious knows everything. Um, hold on, Kim, can you help me get the screen to come up? Sorry, but it, the thing just updated and, and uh, that's my wife. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Is it that box? Click on. I don't know. What's oh, have on. the next one. Next one. It's gonna have to be the next one. Oh, drag it. You need to drag it. This is a brand new computer. Decided to update right in the middle of everything here. So. <laughs> All right, that's going to have to be good enough for that size. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's um, a much wiser person, you know, hiding within me. I've always felt that. Uh, so the subconscious kind of uh, does a lot of work. Um, and I've always kind of, I believe I've had a pretty good ear for dialogue. But um, 
I, I don't know. It just kind of you if you're able to get into that mode, whether it's a state of uh, a deep meditative state or or, or what have you, it, the the voices start talking to you. You have a dozen voices in your head. Right. That's kind of what happens? Have you read that new George Saunders book on the Russian short story? I have not. Well, one of the things Saunders says is that um, when things are working well, the story or the novel, in, the, in this case, is smarter than the writer. Um, and I've been teaching that book, and we had a conversation about it the other night. And, I, and it, is, it seems to me to be the absolute truth. Um, I can think of moments where I literally don't know where something came from, and it feels like the tale I'm telling just is wise in a way that I'm not. Um, and certainly you seem to know all of the characters in this book inside out. Um, and I think the dialogue is one of the ways that, that we get to know them. Um, I am trying to remember when I first, when you sent me the, or your, your publisher sent me the electronic galley, it, was it during COVID or was it even yeah. before that? It was no, it was during COVID. COVID. I, I found the publisher during COVID. And um, yeah, it was, it was everything. I finished it during COVID, found the publisher during COVID. And yeah, it was, it was during that period. How long did it take you to write it start to finish? Well, I started in the summer of 2015, but again, sometimes I would go six months without touching it, especially during uh, the semester. I, I find it immensely difficult to um, get into that headspace when I'm teaching. Um, like I haven't written a word this semester either. Um, and it went through, I guess, maybe five drafts. Um, but when I was writing, things would go pretty quickly. I mean, I, I think in August of, of, uh, 2015, I went to Detroit and spent 12 days in, in a house there, and I wrote 12,000 words, uh, most of which have been changed um, since. Um, but yeah, it, it went through, it, it was a, a six or seven year project, uh, even though I wasn't writing the entire time. And did you, did you basically have, the, did the book always have the same center? In other words, we always had men, we had Shara, but did characters come and go over the, the course of the writing of the novel? No, I, I always wanted to have this as a pretty limited cast. There's really only about four primary characters and then a couple, two ancillary characters. Uh, and that was, they, they're the same characters that, that were there from the beginning to the end. Um, I really wanted to keep it very limited. I didn't want to have extraneous, um, no secondary plot lines or other characters. I wanted it to be a really lean and uh, fast paced book. So yeah, it was, these were always the characters that were there. And you talked a little bit, um, or maybe this is just a conversation you and I had at one point where we were talking about the, the psychology of the novelist. Um, and on every one of my books, there's been a, I've hit a wall at some point somewhere around 80 pages or 100 pages. And it's, it's at that point where I'm either gonna solve some problems or I'm gonna walk away from the project. And I, I have walked away from more projects than I would like to, you know, to acknowledge probably. Does that happen to you? Have you ever, have you ever walked away from a book? Uh, yeah, and painfully so. Uh, I actually have a novel I wrote six full drafts of about a guy who um, sells the Brooklyn Bridge and ends up uh, um, becoming the most hated man in America because uh, an Iraq war widow, widow claims to have lost all of her savings to him. I went through six drafts of that complete. Uh, that, that was five years of writing probably and I just couldn't make it work. And I actually had another uh, book I did, I spent a few years on. Uh, um, it was going to be called the Sunday Synagogue Softball League, and I couldn't make it work, but um, there was about a 22,000 word, 75 page backstory intertwined in between these chapters, which I've pulled out and is going to be uh, the novella that anchors my story collection coming out next year. So, um, yeah, I have gotten rid of things and I, I, I hate that because I don't give up easily. So instead of writing 80 pages, I'll write 300 pages and revise it five times and then realize. So that's, it's tough. Um, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time on that, but you, you learn from everything you do. And 
you know, we, I don't think we ever arrive as a writer. I'm always a student of writing. So every, every hour I spent on that Brooklyn Bridge novel uh, adds towards that 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about to become an expert, um, but it's still painful. Right. Did, did you have any moment like that in, in this book where you, you felt like you were really stuck and you had to fight through it? Uh, I felt like I was stuck and then I hired Michelle Kaplan. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, if anyone wants to hire Michelle Kaplan to help you with your work, I mean, she's incredible. I mean, um, yeah, and, and she always helped me get unstuck. I mean, she gets my work like nobody else does. And, uh, you know, uh, a 15 minute conversation would just give me, you know, months worth of, of possibilities of what I can work on from there. So she's been a godsend uh, for me in my writing career. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to work with her a little bit on this on this new book as well. We had a brief conversation a few weeks ago, but uh, yeah, um, I do get stuck. But sometimes that 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 right person can turn that key in your mind and and unstick you. So when you get through with the novel, and when you've gotten all the way to the end of one, um, and when the novel is is, I I think one of the things that comes across in this book is you, that the writer is really involved in the lives of these characters. You care about the characters and you're, you're able to make the reader care deeply about the characters. They seem so real on the page and I know that they must have seemed very real to you when you were working on the book. So when you're finished with one, um, is it unmitigated joy or do you ever feel uh, a certain degree of sadness to have to let it go? That's a really good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer. I mean, I, I think, well, in, in this case, there's going to be a sequel, but um, I, I don't know. I, I think, I don't know if I feel anything until it's published because then they really exist. Other people are reading it. If I finished it and it's sitting on, on my computer, I always feel this nagging, nagging sense of doubt that it doesn't really exist yet, maybe until mm -hmm. other people see it. I need that kind of validation for that. For that. Um, but, you know, it was nice to spend time with these characters. Um, you know, again, in previous books, I've had, you know, psychopaths and suicide bombers. So it was a relief to put them away. But in this case, I mean, they felt like the kinds of people that I might possibly know. Um, so they felt pretty familiar, but I don't think they're gone yet. Because, again, I'm, I'm still thinking about what their next, uh, what their next step is going to be. Yeah, you know, I, I lived in Oxford, Mississippi for a number of years. And, you know, I know a fair fair number of people from William Faulkner's family or did know them when they were alive. And I think there's a, um, a mistaken impression that Faulkner wrote drunk. But typically he didn't. I mean, he did when he was in Hollywood. But... One of, the, one of the common aspects of all of those terrible binges that Faulkner went on was that they tended to happen after he finished a book and before he started another book. And I have, you know, I have no way of knowing what was in his mind, but I know that um, for me, if I really love the characters in a book, I tend to feel that sense of sadness at letting them go. Um, so I, I just was curious if you. Did. No, I, I think I think that does make sense. Uh, again, in this case, they're not gone yet because I still need to think about them. And I knew around the time I was finishing, and I was thinking there might there might be another chapter for them. Uh, and with the previous book, I was so glad to be through with them. Um, but uh, I find I'm definitely more. Uh, I'm a lot happier when I'm writing, and mm -hmm. I spent so little time writing out of all the time that I'm awake and alive, you know, as I said, I haven't written at all this semester. Um, there is something about uh, playing God in miniature and having these intimate moments in, in creating these characters. You're literally uh, breathing life into them by putting their words onto the page. And uh, that's a very powerful thing. Um, and if I was able to do that every day, uh, you know, I think I'd be a much happier person. Yeah, I'm certainly at my happiest when I'm writing, but, um... I used to think I would write more books if I, if I didn't have to have a job, but I look at just how lazy I am in general. And I, I think I've probably gotten all the books out of myself that, so far that I had in me anyway. 
Um, something that I don't know about you, John, even though I've known you so many years, is I don't know what writers really made you want to be a writer because that's a conversation we've never had. And it's it's always one that I want to have with the writer I admire. Yeah, well, there's, there's a few. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, the, the very first one was Tolkien in second grade, having my teacher, Mrs. Uh, Spooner, call us all onto the carpet and read The Hobbit to us. I mean, I was six or seven years old and I knew I wanted to be a writer back then. And for the next few years, I, I, did, I didn't know what fan fiction was, but that's what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, there was a Lord of the Rings cartoon movie and they did a book of it and I would trace all the pictures from there because I didn't know how to draw and then write, you know, Tolkien fan fiction. And then, you know, later, I think um, discovering uh, Henry Miller in my, uh, late teens made me feel like I could be a writer just reading it. Cause I, I, I think I'd always thought that writing was supposed to be a little more decorous and just seeing the kind of sloppiness and vulgarity and uh, energy of his work really made me feel I could, I could do that. So he was a big influence. Uh, it may not, you know, well, maybe you can see it here a little bit, but he was a huge influence. And then later on um, in my twenties, Milan Kundera was my favorite writer. I, I loved, I loved his writing. Uh, I think some of the more, um, I don't know, some of the philosophical bits maybe come from him. Um, but, um, you know, I love Philip Roth as well, or I did. I mean, I've tried to go back and reread him. It's not the same. But uh, it started off as Tolkien. It's amazing that I've never written high fantasy before because that was what started the whole thing. Right. Um, I, you know, again, you and I spend a lot of time with young writers who, <clears throat> who would love to be where you are right now. Um, doing a, an event for a newly published novel. Yet I know that, that probably, like most of us, you've had some setbacks along the way as a writer. It hasn't always been easy. Um, what has kept you going through those tough times? Well, there's been a, there have been a lot of setbacks, and there's been a lot of pain and a lot of self-doubt. And there's been a lot of times... Um, I recently showed my my 15 year old son the movie Amadeus, which is one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Uh, and there's a scene where where Salieri, who is who is Mozart's kind of nemesis, is uh, kneeling down before a cross, and he's looking at the cross, and he says, "You know, how could you have given me the desire but not the talent?" And I think that's the way you feel sometimes when you're not getting the attention or the recognition. You know, I went through a really dark period when I was writing this book. I thought this was really a book that had had a broad appeal. And uh, I understood why maybe my previous books didn't have such a wide readership because of the, um, some of the violence in it, some of the uh, complex aspects of Judaism and Israel. And I think a lot of people might have felt they needed to be an expert to read it. So the Judaism that I have in this novel is a much more palatable or easier. There's, there's no bar to be able to kind of read it. Um, so I thought this might be a book that a lot of people would be interested. In. So uh, when I was looking for an agent for this uh, during COVID, I was turned down, turned down or, or ignored by 65 agents. And it was devastatingly painful. Uh, I, was, I, I, I didn't know how I could go on. And uh, once again, I was saved by Caroline Levitt. I reached out to her and I said, Caroline, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, what's going on here? I can't find an agent. And she said, well, why don't you reach out to Lou Aronica at, at the story plant and use my name? And I did. And he right away responded because everyone loves Caroline. And uh, he read it and said, you know, if you'll just change the last chapter, uh, I want to go with it. And uh, it helped. But there's a lot of doubts. I mean, this book came out with zero pre-publication reviews. You know, um, I've had starred reviews from Publishers Weekly and Library Journal and nobody touched the book. So it's... It's an ongoing thing, but then you hold the book in your hand and, and you're, I realize, like right now there are people in the world, maybe not a lot, but people are holding this book in their hand and, and reading it. And that's an amazing thing to know that, that the words that I put down while I was sitting alone in my room or in a room in Detroit um, or wherever, uh, they're reading the book and seeing these characters that I created. So it, it is tough. And I often tell my students that if you can do something else, if you have another talent, then, then you should, because there's going to be a lot of pain. Uh, I just don't know what else I'm good at. Uh, and when it works, it works. It's the best feeling in the world. But I don't think we ever arrive. I think we're always, uh, we always want more than what we have. But I, I did play a, a mental uh, game on myself. I kind of learned from one of the meditation apps I use. You know, um, 
go back to a different stage in your life and, 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 and look forward to where you are now. So I go back to 20 years old at York University in Toronto, saying that I wanted to be a published writer and I wanted to teach writing. And 30 years later, I've got five books out with a sixth one coming out. I've been teaching at the same amazing school for 15 years. And uh, by all accounts, that's, that's as much success as I could have ever imagined. So sometimes you just need to reframe things a little bit. And if I can do that, I realize that I'm, I'm, I'm living, living my dream life. Yeah, I, I tell students that when I was where they are in, in a MFA program, my goal was to publish something before I turned 30, publish a book before I turned 40, write three good ones before I died. Um, and that, you know, if someone had told me when I was 22 or 23 that I would ever come close to having anything like the life I've got, I just wouldn't have believed it. it. The distance between where I was, you know, and where I've ended up, it, 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 it just doesn't even feel possible. And I, I think it's, um, I'm sure there's some younger people watching the, this event now. And I, I think it's really important to know that, you know, no matter how successful a writer is, they've probably experienced some real troughs. And sometimes the, you know, the troughs last a long time. Um, my feeling is if you come out of it with a book as good as this one, it's all worthwhile. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that you feel exactly the same way. Well, thank you. Uh, and there's, there's nothing like holding the book in your hand uh, after it sits on your computer for five years and you wonder what'll happen. Um, and, you know, I think, again, we, we always want to do better than we do, but, uh, you know, there's a stack of books I have that's more than a foot high now. Um, and those are all words and people that I created. Um, and sometimes that, that carries me. I know a lot of writers say they don't read their work after they do it. I do. I go back and read my work sometimes to convince myself that I am good and I can do it and I can do it again because um, there is a lot of doubt and there's a lot of resounding silence, you know, uh, you know, first the agents and then not being able to find people interested in reviewing it was tough. And now I'm going to go out and sell the book one book at a time. And, um, you know, it'll come out in paperback next year to give it another chance. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, hopefully people will read the book and love it and tell a friend and they'll read it and they'll tell a friend and just do it the old fashioned way where word of mouth. And I think that can work. Yeah. You mentioned that you have a story collection coming out in the year. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's called um, Gallery of the Disappeared Men. Uh, they're, they're pretty much mostly older stories, stuff I wrote eight or nine years ago. But uh, I think they're the first story is my, one of my favorite things I've ever written. It's, a, it's actually a first-person perspective story about a woman who survives the Holocaust and moves to a town like Waltham and marries a watchmaker and ends up getting tangled up with a gangster. And I just... I love that story so much. I, I just, it just feels like I brought something to life out of, out of the dust and uh, I'm in love with it. But a lot of the other stories are very dark, very disturbing. Uh, one of them has been, been turned into a short film. I'm still waiting for it to be completed, but um, you know, it involves skull fucking. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's some, some pretty dark stories there, but I think they're, there's an intensity to those pieces that I think makes them the memorable. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's as good as my other collections, but I, I, I love it. Like I love my, both my children, you know, it's, they all belong to you and, and they're things you've created. Um, and it's just nice to have a kind of a mosaic of different kinds of stories. Again, some of them are hilarious, are funny and, and some of them are dark and some of them are very sexual and, uh, you know, I've, I've got flash fiction. I've got a 500 word story in there. I've got a 22,000 word story. So it's nice to kind of work in different, different forms and lengths. Right. I know we're supposed to get through with, um, with our portion at 745. So it looks like there's maybe about 30 or 40 seconds left. Could you just also say something about any other future projects? You mentioned you were writing a sequel and uh, it sounds like you, you, have a number of things going at once. Well, I, I, I really would love to have this book and, and the sequel turned in, into a streaming series. I, I found an agent last year uh, who's interested in selling the film rights. And we had a close call back in September with a production company, 
but we've heard nothing from anybody since. Um, but I think um, you'd said before it was cinematic. And I think all of my writing is kind of done in a very visual and, 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 and talky way. And hopefully there'll be a way to kind of turn this into something that you'll be seeing on one of your streaming services. And if that happens, I'd love to be involved in that project and, and adapting it in a way that's open to whatever people I work with to make it the same, but also something different, you know, because I'm, I've seen adaptations that are quite different. And I'm, I'd just love to be part of that and kind of get a little more, more involved in screenwriting. All right. Well, listen, our time here is up, but I've really enjoyed talking with you about the book and I love the book and I urge everyone to run out and grab it. Thank you so much, Steve. You're such a gentleman. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that was a riveting conversation with a lot to think about. Um, now we have uh, some questions to go through. There, people um, have been really talkative tonight. Um, let's see. First one comes from Caroline. It says, your book is about a couple expanding their relationship into uncharted territory, which I loved. How do you personally feel about the state of relationships today? The state of relationships, all relationships? Um, well, I, I, think, I think marriages are changing and, and, and relationships are changing. I think if I'd written this book a generation ago, this would have been a book about adultery and cheating. Um, but I think today, uh, more and more people are re revisiting how a relationship is and uh, you know, trying different forms of it, whether it's an open relationship or a triad or, or who knows. Um, and I think it's really exciting and interesting because, uh, you know, it, it leads to so many more possibilities. I mean, I think uh, in previous generations, a lot of people stayed married and, and they cheated or they were just unhappy. And I think now to be able to do different configurations or even um, with your own partner, kind of meeting other couples, I think it's, it's just, it's, it says a lot for kind of the future of relationships that, that people are kind of more open-minded. And uh, I don't know where the future, I don't know. I, I think it's a good and exciting thing. And uh, I spent a lot of time listening to Dan Savage's uh, podcast and uh, there's millions of different ways people have relationships and uh, people are becoming more and more kind of accepting about all kinds of things. I think it's awesome. Okay. The next question is, it says, uh, this comes from Scott. It says, hey, John, could you talk about the process of developing this story? The process of developing the story? I mean, I think I just started with the idea. I was like, there's, well, uh, yeah, I, actually there is a process behind it. I had the basic idea about, about this, care, this, this couple in an open relationship, but there, there was an underpinning, a philosophical uh, or psychological underpinning here. Um, when I started writing it, I was really thinking about attachment theory and how Ben uh, represented the anxious attachment style, which very much speaks to my own attachment style, something I hadn't really been aware of through the first 10 or so years of my marriage. I'd kind of forgotten about that during kind of a very secure period of my life. And, you know, Shira, the wife, was kind of supposed to represent um, a more secure attachment style, whereas Ben's love interest Pamela was uh, more of an avoidant style. So a lot of this was actually an exploration of attachment theory. And I kind of followed these characters through. I mean, anything that's too theoretical is not interesting. So you put a sense of desire there and then desire uh, that is, um, you know, um, not satisfied and you have conflict. So it really kind of came out of that. I think that's basically the short answer. Otherwise I'd have to go on for like six hours. <laughs> okay, well, and then um, Allison asks, I'd love to hear about your process writing this novel and how the process may have changed due to the pandemic. What did you do differently? It was mostly written by the pandemic. It was almost done by then. Uh, but process wise, I mean, again, I, I sometimes go in with a game plan. Uh, here's what I want to do today. And sometimes I don't. But I always write it by hand always, uh, can never read my handwriting. So as soon as I get to the end of that writing day, whether it's one page or eight pages handwritten, I then dictate it onto my iPad because I also don't type and, uh, and then kind of clean it up from there and then print it up usually, and then read over it with a pen and make little changes and constantly go over that. By the time I got to a uh, hundred pages of the, the novel, I'd probably gone through those first hundred pages 50 or 60 times. I mean, the first 
number of chapters I went through countless times. So, you know, every time I move forward, I always go back and clean up the previous chapters. Um, because to me, I don't like having ugly sentences out there. So I'm always cleaning up my sentences, even if I end up throwing out the whole chapter later on. Uh, it's just my process. So, you know, handwriting, dictating, and then printing and going over it and making changes and then uh, repeating it day after day. So again, the early chapters um, have been through so many uh, sets of uh, um, pass-throughs by the time I get to the end that I'm pretty sure that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, great. Then uh, Caroline asks again, she says, I, I, I always want to know if writers feel that they learn things from writing one novel that they can then apply to a subsequent novel. Was it that way for you? And she also said it never is for me, alas. Well, yeah, uh, what, what applies is that I know I can do it and, and that the mess you're making right now will make sense. It's so writing is an act of faith. So I've learned after having you know, written three novels now that no matter how dark it seems that I, there is a way out of it uh, and you can kind of find ways to make sense of it. So yeah, I, I think that, that that act of faith is, is, um, is justified when you get to the end of it. But otherwise, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's an act of curiosity writing a book and I write because I want to know what happens. Not, I never plan ahead. So I don't know what's going to happen. I write because I want to know what mm. happens. Mostly what I learn is that I can do it and I can do it again. Okay. Uh, then Sean asks, uh, despite what you have said, when asked about the reflective nature of your real life and relationship with your father in your past novels, how much of this story would you say is contingent upon your personal experience slash journey? Uh, he also says no wrong answers, obviously. <laughs> oh, well... I have a great relationship with my father. I mean, we feuded a little bit recently about politics, but I think I'm extremely close with him. And in my previous novel, the father was a monstrous um, character uh, who was a judge. And, and in fact, that character uh, was written as an act of love for my father, because when my grandfather was dying, he had believed that my father as a lawyer had become a judge. It was his dream. And he was so happy that my dad had become a judge. My dad never became a judge. He, he didn't, that just didn't happen. So when I wrote this monstrous judge character, I it was an act of love for my own father uh, that uh, being a judge does not make you a good person and you don't necessarily want to be that. Um, as far as in, in this book, uh, the question was a little complicated. Uh, I just kind of latched on the part about my father. If you can give me just mm -hmm. a kernel of. of... Sure. Um... It, it, it also asked about like, you know, how much of the story was based off of your own personal experience? Well, all of it and none of it. I mean, there's, you know, of the episodes in the story, there's probably less than 0.1% of things that actually came from my life. I'm a fiction writer and I create things, but I think all of the emotional stuff comes is filtered through me. Um, you know, Ben is very much uh, out of the same psychological mode as me. In this book, his, his parents had died in a, in, in a tragedy beforehand. Um, in this case, um, you know, I, I, I just wanted that, that to be a, a way to illustrate his, his anxiety with relationships and his fear of losing them. And that is something I, I have within my own relationships. And that, mm -hmm. that goes way back to my childhood when my parents were divorced and I lived with my mom and I was six years old and I'd come home from school and uh, she wouldn't be home. I was a latchkey kid with no key. And I would like bang on the door. I'd knock on the door. I'd ring the doorbell. I'd shout through the, uh, the mail slot and she wouldn't be there. And uh, uh, I remember doing this for 10, 15 minutes in disbelief. And I think that was the formation of my anxious attachment style. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so interesting how quickly you can go psychologically back to the age of five or six. And I think a lot of that I put onto, onto Ben in this story. Wow. Okay. Then Caroline asks again, you sometimes stop writing because you lost confidence. What makes you get that confidence back? People like Caroline. I think sometimes just having people say you can do it and you're good because um, it's important to have um, people who support you and love you in your corner because out there in the literary world, it's pretty, it's pretty tough. I mean, as I said, I, I couldn't, even get called back from a few agents that I'd met personally and had good experiences. I, there was even one agent who said, you know, I've, I wanted to represent your first book. I loved it. You know, if you ever need a friend in the literary world, I'm here. And when I reached out to her three times about this book, she ignored it. 
Mm. So you want to that that those kind of things are are, are tough. You you start to feel invalidated and that you're no good. But then knowing that there are people that that are touched by your work, um, it, it, it kind of gets you going again. It's it's kind of cyclic. I, I'm never able to stay confident for very long. Um, but also the lack of confidence doesn't last forever either. And I think perhaps moving forward, realizing that it's a cycle and that it will come back around, maybe that'll mitigate things uh, next time it happens. Okay. Now, Scott asks, what is your writer's routine? Do you work with a daily word count, page count, or time limit? Uh, <laughs> it depends. It really depends. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I'm going to write. 10 pages by hand today, which I've done a few times. And, and then I'm going to stop. And usually those days when I write 10 pages by hand, it's been, I accomplished that in about an hour. It's like, mm -hmm. as I said, when it's happening, it's happening. And when it's not, it's not. So there's other days I've sat down and I can't write a sentence. You know, right. I get very afraid. Like I, I'm very afraid of writing a bad sentence. So sometimes I don't write anything at all for fear of that. And I know that's terrible. Mm -hmm. I tell my students that they should always write and not be afraid, but I'll admit sometimes I get afraid of seeing that there's nothing left in the tank and that I'm an empty person. Uh, and some days that's the case, but other times you come back around and yeah, and it flows if you can get into that place. So yeah. I, don't, I don't have a routine. Um, you know, um, I'm going to break a little bit of news here. I've actually been granted a uh, presidential leave uh, at Emerson College. So I've actually got oh. fall semester off and I'll be spending four to six weeks in, in Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, and I definitely want to get into a daily schedule there because I won't have my schoolwork to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so I might get up and say, you know, I'm not leaving the house to explore Jerusalem until I've done 2000 words or something like that. I'm definitely gonna, I mean, I have put those things into play before and I, I will definitely do it when I'm away for sure. But, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a whole semester and I'd like to finish uh, this sequel novel during that period. Right. And, you know, what you, you said, you said earlier, it's hard, it's hard for you to write during the semester, but I imagine that, you know, going to, to, a, to a place like Jerusalem, you know, will, you know, also lead to some inspiration. Yeah. It's my favorite place in the world. Um, you know, uh, and I, I just love to be there and, uh, you know, I've already reached out to my publisher and said, you know, like, if I need you to put the fear of God into me, uh, will you do that? He said, well, I, I won't do that. But, you know, I, I, if you want to send me some chapters every couple of weeks. So, you know, <laughs> once I kind of get through this semester, I can I can say, Lou, like, I, I'm going to get your chapter in two weeks. And if I'm not, then you can get mad at me or something like that. So I think knowing somebody's waiting helps. And I haven't written under contract before. I have a three book contract here. Previously, everything was one book at a time. So um, that is a nice thing to have here. And I, I do want to kind of have the, the mind space to, to get back into it after the semester. I'm going to take advantage of, of, of the possibility of, of having people be mean to me if I don't write. <laughs> okay. Now, Allison asks, you work with writers also, right? What do you specialize in with your clients? What do I specialize in? Well, fiction. I mean, any anyone who, who sends me their, their fiction, I mean, I deal with a lot of the, the big picture issues, structural issues. But lately, I've been more and more interested also in language and things right down to the sentence mm -hmm. level. Uh, I mean, I'm reading a book right now or listening to an audio book of a pretty successful novel. I'm not going to say what it is, but I'm amazed how many of their sentences wouldn't pass muster in my class. I mean, there's there's all kinds of like uh, filter words. Like the character's always, I feel, I saw, I heard. It's like, just see it, feel it, hear it. You know, like um, it's kind of driving me mad. So like you know, <laughs> work with, make sure that everyone kind of gets their sentences clean, make sure the logic is there. Um, but, you know, I, I work very closely with my, my writers, especially um, uh, more closely with my clients than my students because with the students we end up workshopping and we have 15 mm -hmm. voices there. With my clients, uh, there's no one after me and they're paying me. So I make sure that, uh, you know, every sentence is exactly the way they're going to want it to be when they send it right. out there in the world. Okay. Now, Corbett asked something that I also want to know, which is... Uh, uh, if, hmm? No, not about well, baseball. No, he asked if, if the Brooklyn Bridge novel could be explored at a later date. Well, it's funny. I did reach out to my publisher a few weeks ago and I said, I don't know, maybe there's something I can salvage there. I think a lot of it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pre-social media, but who, who knows? Maybe six months of adapting it. Uh, and again, maybe if I got it into Caroline's hands or Michelle Kaplan looked at it, maybe there is a way to do it because there's a lot I like about it. I think it's a very funny novel. And in the later drafts, the character... Um, 
uh, starts has these hallucinations that I thought were quite interesting uh, hmm. as well. So I, I would want to explore it, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think I may pull it out again. It's quite long, um, but if there's if there's a hundred pages that are usable in there, that's that's a pretty good start. So maybe. Yeah. It's, that's and it's a great premise. Um, Caitlin asks, uh, perhaps because I've listened to the Spotify playlist for this book, I would love to hear about how you see music affecting your writing and or character building during the drafting process. I think it comes and goes. I mean, I don't generally listen to music when I write. I find it hard to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but I I love music. If I had the slightest bit of talent, I would be involved in music in my life. Um, and Caitlin, I did, I updated the, the playlist again. I think it's finally complete, but there is, there, so there is a Spotify playlist uh, for this. If anybody wants to find the accompanying playlist, if you just go on Spotify and type in, I am my beloveds um, or a novel playlist, it should be there. Um, but you know, so half the, maybe a third of the songs actually appear in the book. They're either mentioned or they're playing in the background. And then the other two thirds are things that kind of capture the, uh, the mood of what, what's happening there. Um, but I do think as someone who has no musical talent that my sentences are very rhythmic and there are music in their own right. And I really do kind of pay attention to the, the, the beats and the syllables and things like that. So um, for someone, again, who can't play an instrument, I think there is a fair amount of music just in, in, the, in the sentences here. I wouldn't say they're, they're um, ordinary sentences. They're, there's a music to them and, 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 and all, all good writing, I think, should have music to it. Mm -hmm. Um. River asks, how difficult was it to revise the last chapter? Were the changes radical? Do you feel they ultimately made the book better? And did you feel that way when the changes were proposed? They, were, they, the change, aren't they? they were not radical, the changes at the end. And mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, as I said before, I probably went over the first 100 pages 50 or 60 times. I had written the, the final chapter one time, and I knew the ending was uh, up in the air. It ends up... Um, well, I can't, I'm not going to give it away, but no, it, it took me a, a day or two um, uh, uh, to fix it. It was just three or four pages that needed changing. Uh, and it just kind of changed the tone and gave it the, the right feel where, where Ben didn't walk away feeling like he was the king of the castle and won everything. I wanted to show that he still um, uh, had some pain after going through all of this experience um, because everyone else was suffering too. But, but yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty minor, but uh you know, I was open to it, but I remember the publisher was quite, he's like, you know, I, I hope if you're, if you're willing to make those changes, because uh, I, I've heard stories about people who won't make such changes and they, they turned down a book contract. I was, I was like, dude, I wrote this, this chapter one time. I'm totally willing to revisit it. And, and the ending is exactly the way it needs to be. So uh, yeah, I wrote the last chapter basically two times to get it right. Okay. Um, David asks, is humor difficult for you? What do you have to say about the different kinds of humor that we encounter in the book? Uh, I don't think humor is difficult for me. I think it's hard to write humor. Uh, I, as I said, there was none in my previous book. I think I've always seen myself as funnier than my, than my wife sees me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, like I always thought of myself as a very funny person. Um, people who don't know me probably would find that surprising, but people who do know me wouldn't. Um, no, I didn't find the it's not a matter of difficult. Like, I think, I think writing for me is either very hard or not. It's like, if you can't, if, if I'm struggling, it's not happening. If I get in that zone, you turn on the faucet and it comes out, the subconscious speaks to you. So I don't think humor or dialogue or description or drama, I don't think anything is more difficult than anything else once I get into that place. And again, you know, it's like, like meditation is for some people, which I find immensely difficult. But when I'm writing, I guess that's my own form of meditation. So you're 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 tapping into a, a subconscious that's full of everything you've ever experienced. So again, I don't think anything is any harder than the other once I'm able to get to that that place. Mm -hmm. um, River asked John, "How difficult was it to revise the last?" Oh, okay, that that's been answered. All right. Um, Okay, uh, Chandra Yi asks, do you chart out the storylines at the beginning or do you follow a few key characters and some wider arcs? Uh, I follow desire. I always start, start with desire, which leads to conflict and follow it. I never map it out ahead of time. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, I end up having to go back and rewrite sometimes. But uh, you just follow one, con I mean, this book is basically... I wanted it to be a breathless novel where there are no you know, boring parts. Mm -hmm. So I move from one conflict to the next, to the next. And you can do that. Uh, I think it was Bernard Malamud who, who said, you know, writing a novel is a lot like, you know, driving a car on a dark highway with the headlights on, you know, you can only see 
20 feet ahead of you, but you can make the entire journey that way. And I think that's kind of my my sense until I get to a certain point, maybe when you hit a critical mass, I don't know, it's 50 pages or 100 pages, other chapters start to reveal themselves down the road. You start to realize like, oh, later on, I'm going to need to do that. So I, I'll put up maybe a one sentence note saying there's going to be a chapter about this, but I don't, I rarely, if ever, no, I never write out of order, which I should do. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll just put a note there that this is going to come up later and I kind of keep it that way. But no, I, I don't really plan it. I'm, I guess if there's that, I'm more of a seat of the pants person, but I follow the conflict wherever it leads. Okay. Now, Paul asks, <laughs> how many games will the Blue Jays win this, this season? Just kidding. Are you learning new things about Ben by writing from Shira's perspective for the sequel? 94. And um, <laughs> it's interesting. I don't know. I don't think so. Right now, Shira is so alive here. I mean, I think she's more alive than Ben is in that book. But I'm not sure I'm feeling Ben right now. And I need to figure out a way. And I've put the offer out there to a few of my friends that after they read this novel, I'm my beloved, is if they want to look at the first act and we can kind of brainstorm together, uh, that's that's out there. So I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble tapping into Ben right now because it's so much Shira's story. And part of me wants to write the entire book in her perspective. But there are a few things I need to switch from. But I'm I'm loving being in Shira's perspective and I'm learning a lot more about her and she's what a, what a great place to be, you know, in, in a different person. So, um, but not so much about Ben at this stage. Okay. Um, Fatine asks, how many book tours will you have and where? Well, I'm coming to San Francisco and I'm staying with Fatin. Um, so in, in June, I'm going to be out there. I'm, I'm going to be speaking, uh, uh, reading at uh, Charlie Jane Anders series, uh, writers with drinks, which sounds amazing. And at a JCC and, uh, I don't know. I'm going to try and reach out to some other bookstores out there and see if anybody will have me, but I'll be there for a week and I want to do as much as I can, but I'll be reading at AWP in Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to be doing something at the Providence library. Um, you know, things are kind of coming piece, piece by piece in, uh, in July, I'll be in Toronto. I don't have an event set up, but I'm going to try and set it up with a couple other writers. Um, so we'll see. Um, it, it depends. I, I, I love being out in public. I mean, uh, I, this is this is a great opportunity of doing it online that I have my friends from all over the country and all over the world that are able to attend. But uh, it, it will be nice to get back in person. And, uh, you know, as yeah. more people read the book, I'm sure things will come up. So I'm, I'm open to whatever whatever comes my way. OK, and the last couple of questions. Um, Jessamine asks or says or asks, it's always been a struggle for writers not to not procrastinate, but the Internet makes it harder than ever. I'm curious about the state of your ability to concentrate. It's the worst. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I have the worst concentration in the history of the world, I think. Uh, it's possible that I could look at my phone 40 times in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's tough. And I've done things before. I've taken my phone. I've, put, I've locked it up in my mailbox. And then I've taken the key and I've put it somewhere else. And then an hour later, I'm going to the, get the thing out. So it's, I find it very hard to concentrate. Um, I think sometimes um, carving out space, again, it's very hard during the semester because I've got other little responsibilities always floating around. So I'm hoping in the fall when I'm, when I'm off, I'm really able to say, you know, like three hours, Kim, here's my phone and, uh, and just do it. Um, but I find it immensely difficult to concentrate. Um, so when I do get into those rhythms where I can write 10 pages in an hour, which is rare, it's an incredible feeling, you know, you're, just, you're basically, you're just a scribe for yourself, uh, for your subconscious, basically. But I, I, I have immense difficulties. Uh, the phone, uh, I'm addicted to it. I can't believe I haven't looked at the phone in an hour and nine minutes. <laughs> okay, and last question from Sarah. How do you decide what changes to accept or reject when you get that kind of feedback? Uh, I think, Good feedback should never be a surprise. Mm -hmm. It's always like shining a light on something uh, hidden under a rock or something like that. And it should be an aha moment. Uh, you know, if anyone gives you something that's totally out, out of left field, it's usually bad advice. But again, luckily with my editor, who didn't work very much on this book, it came to him pretty clean because of Michelle and Caroline. But he's been, he's read through the first act and, and um, you know, his feedback was was pretty, very complimentary and pretty helpful. Um, so again, uh, if I get stuff out of left field, usually it's just the wrong reader. Um, you want to find people that, that are, are speaking your same language, but I've been pretty lucky with that. Great. Well, that was it for the questions. It's been a lively night, a lot of, lot of good 
commentary. Um, John, Steve as well, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, to everyone else, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I, if again, you can buy the book through our uh, through Belmont Books, our website. If you are within the U.S., we do ship. Um, Do you want me to come by and sign some books? Do you have them in the store yet? Have they arrived? I don't know that they've arrived yet, but that would be wonderful uh, yeah. when when they when they do come in. And I certainly would like my copy signed. Sure, yeah, it should um, be in the next week or so because I know uh, okay. Amazon is a week behind getting uh, getting online, but Amazon seems to be getting their act together now. So I think there was a lot of boxes sitting unopened in warehouses, and I think they're going to be opened right now. So yeah, oh. I'll, be, I'll be happy to come in and sign it. For sure. Fantastic. Yes. And to, to everyone else, I, I really hope you enjoy this book as much as I did. It was it, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. And Steve, thank you. And Elizabeth, thank you. And thank you all for coming. I can't wait to see you all in person, whether you're in Canada or wherever. But uh, I hope to see all of you sometime this year. All right. Do we... Um, know how many people were there at the end uh, I lot my screen shrank down after after so there were 39 at one point including us but then then I couldn't access the at peak it was over 40. yeah good so that's a good turnout are you pleased yeah. with that number mm? are you pleased with that that turnout yes that's a good number Excellent. good well that was a lot of fun so uh uh I'll reach out maybe next week I'm up in Waltham uh, twice a week uh, okay so, um, you know, maybe I'll swing by and if the books are there, I'll sign them. Um, but thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I think this is a great success. Uh, hopefully moving forward, people will be doing live events again. It looks like we're heading that way, I think. It looks like it. Yes. There was a lot of benefits about doing this because I have so many friends in other cities. So this, this worked out really nicely. It really did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. You too. You're getting all your little texts and everything coming in now. Yes. Oh.